Hello friends, Susan Axelrod here, The Confidence Coach. Welcome to this episode of How to Live a Confident and Calm Life. Today, I have a question for you. It's an important question and one I wonder if you have ever considered. Have you ever thought about life without alcohol? Life without alcohol? What is that? What does that look like? And anyway, why would you? These are some of the questions that my dear friend Nadine Searle and I are going to approach today in this podcast conversation. Nadine, hello. How are you today? Hello, Susan. I'm good. Thank you. I, I know we have, we have across the miles. We're so far apart, but we are in different climates as well, aren't we? You told me you have snow. Yep. We have sunshine. It's like a beautiful spring day here. So we're completely different, aren't we, at the moment? Well, I am coming from Northern Arizona where we are having a snowstorm today, even though it is the very last day of March and Nadine is in England where usually often it might be raining, but today it's sunny. So who knows how it's going to go, but there is one thing that I know Nadine and that is our conversation today as always is going to be deep, meaningful and extremely impactful. This question, life without alcohol, is something that you and I have been discussing for quite a long time now. And in uh, today's episode of this podcast conversation, we decided to go right into it. So I want to let our listeners know that nine months ago, Nadine and I had a conversation uh, connected to your cancer diagnosis, Nadine. Uh, we have been having ongoing conversations throughout this time. And nine months ago, early in your journey, of course, we touched on this conversation. And I went back and I listened to some of that conversation just to be um, aware of what we said. Um, in our very last episode, we talked about looking at myself in the mirror today, who am I? What is the image that I see? I'm gonna make a, a note of that podcast link in these comments because <laughs> it was an extraordinary conversation. Um, but I was looking at us and listening to us having that conversation then. And the one thing I, I thought we might start with this today that you asked yourself and we discussed in that conversation was this. My liver is already working hard enough for the chemotherapy and to process through what I have to take. Why would I um, make it work even harder by toxifying it with alcohol? So I thought this might give us a place to start Nadine and then we're going to go much further than that because we're going to talk about uh, life without alcohol from my viewpoint as well, having nothing to do with a cancer journey or uh, taking chemo drugs you know, that have to be processed through my liver. But let's start here uh, today, Nadine. What do you think about that choice that you've made and how, did you, how do you feel about the way you thought about it? You're absolutely right. That is what started it. And I remember that conversation. I remember it started as a private conversation and you said, can we record it? And we did, didn't we? And I wasn't ready for that at all. I can tell by the way I look, but that's <laughs> irrelevant, isn't it? It's the content. And it was so valuable. And I have looked back. I look back at our conversations quite often, as you do. And I honestly feel that my, my reason then which was to stop the alcohol because of my body doing enough, it getting enough toxins in, is still right, it's still true. I'm still making that choice more than anything for that reason. But it has, because I've been doing it now for quite a while, it's led on to lots of other benefits, I would say. There's other reasons. It's made me feel differently. It's leading me to question a lot of my choices. So, so I'm still in that process of actually still making that decision all the time. It's it's not as if I'm going, I don't drink alcohol anymore. It's not that simple for me. It might never be. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I think that's quite a good thing because I question it all the time. 
Um, but it is primarily my head, my intelligence says, why would you do that to yourself when your liver is doing enough? So that is still really the number one reason, if you like, but there's so much more, which we will. I mean, there's so much more. And also you already hit on three things that I had to note down uh, to really address, but I want to stay here for a moment. Life without alcohol, when you have cancer, when you um, are taking these types of medications or whatever, and when you become aware of uh, the body systems and how they work, uh, what the liver is, what it does in your body, how it works, then I wonder if it might be easier to make that decision because of that reason. You know, I don't know, we were having conversations um, before your cancer diagnosis, perhaps not exactly like this, uh, but I don't know that we ever touched on this topic in the days before, but rather, uh, as you know, I have a, a personal journey, um, you know, with alcohol use disorder myself, not, not mine personally, um, but someone close to me, but even still, this didn't come up. So I'm reflecting now. It's interesting, uh, Nadine. It really was because of your cancer diagnosis that you started thinking like this and kind of made that decision for now. Yes, you're right. And that is what I, I, I say, you know, there are so many blessings from my cancer diagnosis. And this is one of them because it's given me an opportunity to maybe break free from that habit, that pattern. I have, and you're absolutely right, Susan, we have talked about this in so many different ways um, of all of the time that we've been having these discussions. Um, and I have quite often touched on the fact that I drank for the wrong reasons, drink too much, that kind of thing. Talking about it as if it's in my past, but it wasn't in my past. I'm not saying it is now, but that is def I'm definitely in a different place now. But I never really addressed it. I did cut down my drinking massively. I did that about 20 odd years ago and changed my drinking habits to cut it down, but still had that and still had those moments when I would drink to excess. Um, and so it is changing. So it has given me that, like you say, as what I say, it's a bit of a blessing in a way to go, I've got a reason to hold on to, to actually say no. So that's that's a good thing, and I and I want to just put it out there as well for anyone that's listening to this that is going through cancer treatment and has a diagnosis and and whatever stage they're at, not to put anyone down for choosing to have a drink to go through that because actually you know we all need something, we all need whatever we need, and that so everybody's choices are personal. This is just my choice for my own reasons, and I don't want anyone to feel that I'm belittling their choices because. You know, there are times when I feel absolutely rotten and sometimes, you know, the idea of just having something to take that pain away. Yeah. Is that, and it can be a drink and that's OK. I'm not putting anyone down. For that. Right. So this is uh, important. Um, anyone who knows us in this iteration of ourselves, yourself and, and me and myself knows that we're not here to proselytize. We're not missionaries. We're not trying to get anyone to do anything or to not do anything. That's not what we're doing here today. So I want to thank you for bringing that up. Rather, uh, Nadine and I show up uh, in honest earnestness to share our experiences, which are deeply personal, to edify. And yes, I'll speak for myself here, um, to be a role model. If anything I do is worthy of role modeling uh, to live a conscious and well life, then yes, um, especially for my young people, all the young people I love around me, um, that would be one of my personal goals, my personal vision for having uh, these types of conversations in public. So uh, thank you very much for that, Nadine. Um, 
So yes, we made the decision, you made the decision uh, for reasons uh, that were really out of your control. Um, cancer was done to you. It's not something you did to get cancer. And, um, and then uh, you immediately, very quickly on, on the cancer journey, made a decision to focus on your health. There's other areas, um, perhaps we'll talk about that another time. You've been so forthcoming about your weight loss and yeah. such um, as happens. Oh, we just came up with our next um, podcast yeah. <laughs> topic. Um, uh, so we can look at that. So um, <clears throat> I wanna jump over. So you made the decision for yourself uh, because of your cancer diagnosis. Why would I make my liver work harder? Uh, we're not um, imposing that anyone else should make this decision. Uh, this decision is ours and ours alone. It came up for me that I want to say very clearly, Nadine, right now, uh, to our viewers and to our listeners, to whom are we speaking today? So I'm very aware with the books that I write, uh, all the work that I do, that I am speaking uh, to people in particular. So to whom am I speaking today? My reason for being here uh, would be anyone who has ever wondered um, whether or not they could live an alcohol-free life. We're gonna talk much more about that. I'm gonna share my own experience with this. Uh, to anyone who has had the experience of living with someone in alcohol use disorder, um, that's partly why I have made my decision thus far. Uh, to anyone who wants to help the especially young people around them or anyone else uh, in their experience uh, to be an ally, to be an ally as the person who is being alcohol free, um, such that someone who is uh, struggling with alcohol use disorder at the low, medium or high level as it's diagnosed, um, so that they have someone else um, whose you know, hand they can hold um, physically or uh, spiritually. And that, that's whom I'm speaking to today. So what resonates in that for you, Nadine, as the people, you know, to whom are you speaking and why would you be willing to come and have this conversation today? I love that you put it that way, Susan. And I'd like to just say as well to say to anyone who is listening or watching this, to reach out to us personally if they have any questions or if they want any help and support, because we are both experiencing this, aren't we? Real life, real time. And, you know, we're not experts. We're not, I'm definitely not fully there yet, but I can share. This is why, like you say, we share our experience to help people. So if anyone wants to personally reach out, I'm sure I'm okay to say this on your behalf as well, Susan. Mm -hmm. You know, please contact us personally because we will share with you and help if we can. And that is the reason that I want to share with your encouragement. Thank you very much. I always say that because you've encouraged me from the start of this to be public with what we're talking about because I know now, and I'm sure you do, get feedback that we are helping people. People are going, oh, I liked what you said. Thank you for sharing that, that kind of thing. It helps people. So for me personally, I really feel that anyone who has, like me for decades, been going, oh, I drink too much. I'm drinking for the wrong reasons and not being able to deal with it, to actually get the message that actually, that you know, there's not one way to deal with this. There's no right or wrong. It's just trying, it's questioning the reasons, maybe looking at the feelings behind it all. These are things that I am doing massively now. Um, I'm not saying any of it is very comfortable. You know, I'm really looking at feelings and things that I used to be able to just push away with a drink. Um, but it's all beneficial. So I'm coming through it and I'm going through the process of actually learning so much about my choices. Um, and also to feel that, there is, there is another way. I have a choice. And for full disclosure, I've got to say, I have not said I'm never going to drink again. I don't know if my personality will let me do that because I'm a bit of a rebel. To say I'm never going to might just tip me over to go, that will tempt me to. I'm not really sure. That I, I actually, I, I wrote that down before when I said there's a few things already. I wrote this down and I think we're going to go here right now. So, um... You've shared the reasons that you um, 
are alcohol free at this time. And um, before we go to the comment, I'm I'm not saying I'm not going to drink alcohol ever again. I wrote that down and I'm gonna get to that in a minute, but I just want to um, share that I personally made a decision to be alcohol free. Um, uh, it, I have personal reasons that I'm not going to speak about here in this public forum, uh, just to say that I was connected personally to someone in deep alcohol use disorder. Um, I didn't know it for a very long time and so on, um, as does happen, I'm, I'm realizing um, more and more. I'm realizing that, and um, even though I ne I don't have a problem with alcohol myself, I never came close to having a problem unless you consider my freshman year of college when I possibly did have a problem, <laughs> you know, going off and partying, uh, you know, drinking parties on weekend and all of that, but um, that didn't even continue in college. It, it never became problematic at all. Um, Interestingly, I'm excruciatingly aware that sometimes alcohol leads to rape or um, other problems, loss and, you know, attack and other problems because you're making bad decisions when you're under the influence of alcohol. So I thank God uh, and I feel blessed that that never did happen to me. So in last year, um, I realized I was already drinking quite uh, less, quite quite a little, because when you know um, one person close to you, or now I know countless people who are have some level of alcohol use disorder, um, I just had this feeling like, why would I be drinking? And especially if you're worried about anybody in your life, even more so, why would I be drinking? And so as time went on uh, last year for me, uh, and the year uh, is not relevant to the topic at hand, this video could be being watched five years from now. You know, this is not a timely conversation. It just happens to be relevant for this comment. Um, on a Facebook thread, a large group of women that I'm on, I saw somebody make a comment about alcohol-free drinks. And then all these people started sharing what their alcohol-free drinks were. Oh, I do, I do this, I do that, and I do the other thing. And I really had never, ever been in awareness of this, Nadine. Like, why are these people talking about this? And also, why are so many people and all of that, believe it or not, I, I, I don't know. I just had never really come up for me in exactly that way. Um, this is one of the reasons I love social media. And at that moment, I thought to myself, wow, all these people seem to be living this alcohol-free life. I wonder what that's like. And, you know, very quickly, you know, I process and integrate very quickly, Nadine, and, and I sort of thought through it all. And I um, realized how little I was using alcohol. And then I just made a decision um, that it happened to be in the fall. I know the exact day that it was that I'm going to live an alcohol-free life for a while, okay? Just like you said, I'm not willing to say it forever, and I'm going to get to that now, but I'm going to live an alcohol-free life for a while, and then I didn't make a big announcement, which is unusual for me, as you know. <laughs> I live my life out loud. I didn't say anything to anyone. I just went about it. I didn't already drink that much, so mostly it didn't matter, but when I was out, Thanksgiving came up where my family would notoriously be drinking wine. And Susan, do you want some? No, thank you. That was it. Nobody commented, nobody asked. That was it. There was no discussion, I no big pronouncements. Um, and, and from that time to this, I have been alcohol free. Um, we're coming into less than a year now. Over this time, it has been an interesting journey, deeply reflective as we do Nadine. And I too have said to myself, well, I'm not saying I'm not ever going to drink alcohol again. Okay, so now we're, we're at that comment. So both of us are sitting here saying, I'm not saying I'm, not, I'm ne never gonna drink alcohol again. It's a very interesting thing to reflect 
And what immediately comes up when somebody says, well, I'm not saying I'm never going to drink alcohol again is like, why not? Why aren't you saying that? Mm -hmm. Right. And so let's start there. <laughs> well, well, do you know, I, I'm not sure about what I'd answer on that. I think there's, there is a bit of me, maybe it's a bit of a cop out. I'm going, I want to give myself the opportunity to have a drink if I want to. Um, that could be, I don't know if that's a good or a bad thing. I'm not sure. But for me, that is my, my way of dealing with it at the moment to actually go, I don't want any, I remember saying years ago um, that I heard someone being told they couldn't ha ever have a drink again. And I thought, I never want that to be me. So I don't want anyone telling me I can't, but this, you're actually saying the question about you saying it yourself. I'm not comfortable actually putting that statement out there. So I'm actually, maybe it's a bit like the uh, Alcoholics Anonymous one day at a time, I don't know. This is what I'm choosing for today. But also I feel for me personally, and I think it might be for you as well, um, it's, I've got this curiosity about it. It is more of a bit of an experiment to actually go, well, you know, what, how does it feel? How is, how are things very different? When I look back at my life and, and look at times when I did choose alcohol and I'm not choosing it now, you touched earlier on, you know, the, the way that people are quite vulnerable when they drink too much and everything. When I look back to my youth, goodness knows, you know, I put myself in so many dangerous situations. I don't, someone's looking after me, thank heaven, um, because it chills me to my bones to think about the situations I was in and how I'm still here thankfully you know and I look back and I think how ridiculous was that but that's what I did so again it's choosing those you know looking after myself better is a lot of my motivation now um in so many ways in every way you know health wise but also for my um self-care um my self protection you know my my life if you like um but also when I had recently, I went out um, on a social occasion. I shared it on social media at a birthday party of three of my very good friends. And as people know, I haven't been out for such a long time with the lowered immunity and all of the stuff I've been through and feeling so rotten and everything. So it was a big deal for me. And I wasn't drinking. So that was another thing, you know, oh, I'm not drinking. So, oh, of course, I can drive, <laughs> you know. But that again, right. just, there is that. The questions of, okay, so I'm going to be the driver, but that, you know, I had to reset some boundaries because I didn't want to be out too long because I get really tired still. So I wanted to go at the time I wanted to come back at the time I wanted. If I'm the designated driver, you know, it used to be, well, then you're just driving around drunk people. So you do what they want and everything. But no, I didn't want that. So how I've changed new boundaries, new self-care, new, new actually saying what I want rather than just going with the flow. And again, I look back to when I used to go out and have a drink. I was totally like, oh, whatever, someone else is controlling what time I get home, what's going on. I didn't know what was going on. I didn't care. So this is very, very different. This is a new way. So that, that was a massive, wonderful experience, actually, very emotional and did raise a lot of questions. Um, so I do feel that for me, as I say, it's, I'm not going to say it <laughs> for lots of reasons. Um, and also, as I touched on earlier, I'm a little bit of a rebel. If I actually make that statement, self-sabotage, I think, is more the word. I will then ruin it for myself. So I don't want to put that there as a hard and fast thing to fight against. I I want to treat this quite lighthearted isn't the right word, but without those rules and those those expectations, just to see how I go. And And I don't want to set myself up to fail either because I do feel that I could easily do that and then I'd be quite down on myself. And that's not what this is about. So this is more about making those choices, as I say, day, day to day almost, you know. So this is really important. Uh, I'm reflecting um, to hear you say, in those days when I was drinking, I didn't think about driving. Somebody was going to drive. Didn't matter what time we got home. And that was just that, you know, I, it was yes. just a whole different way of like, let's party, baby. And, yes. um, and, and now, um, of course you brought up, you know, setting boundaries, saying what I want for me, which is, uh, healthier for me 
it's more well for me. Um, and then because uh, alcohol addiction is narcissistic, right? Addiction is narcissistic. Oh no, honey, it's not what you want. It's what I want. Addiction is narcissistic. So, um, and then you said, I'm a rebel. You said that two times and, and, but then you explained, um, why would I create a hard, fast thing to fight this decision? I'm never going to drink again. Why would I create this hard, fast thing to fight? So we just want to acknowledge here. We both know very well, personally, deeply, we both know people and obviously countless others who are who have been told by a doctor if you keep drinking you will die you can never drink again right in alcoholics anonymous this is the the way it goes you can never drink again they count the days that you are without alcohol so we're not here even to talk about aa because i i personally haven't been to aa i don't think aa has been in your life either you're shaking your head no and so um but I want to acknowledge in even this conversation um, that uh, no, neither of us have ever been told you can never drink again or you will die. Even though I'm wondering to tell you the truth, Nadine, there were times in your life as you've shared that level of use that you've had, that you had in the past, um, there might have been times that you got what we call fatty deposits on your liver, yeah. right? Yeah. I'm sure, and to be honest, Susan, I'm sure it would be said to me at some point in time. You know, I, I would, I would have avoided that conversation with it. I used to lie to my doctor about how much I drank. I don't know if everybody does that, but I did. It's really interesting because recently, doing any medical forms or anything, I can tick tick the box saying no alcohol. <laughs> That's weird, right? <laughs> um, but it's, but it is interesting, and and you're absolutely right. I know for a fact that the alcohol was damaging my body. I know that myself. I don't need a doctor to tell me that. And it definitely was. And we've talked about my weight issues. You know, alcohol doesn't help with that at all. Yeah. Um, for so many reasons. And people are probably very familiar with that. Um, also, you know, you and I, Susan, are women of a certain age, you know. Our of a certain are age. <laughs> like, you know, our hormones are changing. We don't deal with alcohol as well as we used to. And I think you said earlier, you know, people around you, you're noticing more that people are giving up alcohol. In my social circle, if you like, my world, what's on my radar, there's a lot of women my sort of age, and it just doesn't work that well. You know, our bodies don't deal with alcohol so well. That's a recognised fact. I'm not an expert on how hormones work, but I've had my own hormone issues. Um, maybe brought on by alcohol. I started drinking alcohol at a very young age. Maybe that upset my hormones. I don't know. So it has done me a lot of damage. So at some point in time, some doctor would have been saying you need to stop drinking. But again, it's a choice, isn't it? And like you say, you know, you have this um, experience of someone close to you with alcohol use. I was surrounded by people that misused alcohol. Um, again, I might have chosen that to make myself feel better because I would always compare myself to other people going, I don't drink as much as they do, that kind of thing. Um, oh. I never saw I never suffered from hangovers. You know, I I counted myself as quite lucky the amount of drinks that I could get through, which is when I look back, I think, wow, ridiculous is that? Um, because I don't know. I don't know how my body would cope now because it, everything is different in my body. So I really don't know. So there's lots of reasons that, you know, why I've made that choice, why I'm not going to say never, Um but yeah, it, it really is. And as I touched on earlier, you know, it's really making me question everything, every choice, you know, from the past, because I am trying, you know, it's in a way, this is part of me improving my life because of my cancer diagnosis. And again, as I said, it's a blessing. Um, but looking at what I was doing in the past and why I chose what I chose and what I was doing, because I'm trying to deal with the emotional side of it as well. This is a big thing for me as well, you know, choosing the alcohol for numbing reasons that kind of thing right we're gonna um we're gonna get i want to get into that but before we do i just want to acknowledge nadine this is deep shit going on right here i mean honestly it's coming up for me 
um, what we're here doing, sharing, saying out loud, knowing this is a public forum that we've created uh, with the hope and intention and commitment to inspire and motivate, to even instigate, you know, other people having this blatant, honest conversation with themselves. Uh, you said, um, you said, Oh, I used to lie to my doctor about how much I drank. Uh, in my own experience, I didn't know that was a thing until I learned that that indeed is, was a thing. Um, I spoke to um, an old, old friend of mine um, <clears throat> at a certain point and he turned, he became a family doctor. That's what he is. I was speaking to him late at night one night about all this, just asking for help and support or anything, information. And he said the same thing to me. He said, Susan, you would have never believe how many people lie to me. And I say to them, I'm your doctor. Why are you lying to me? But without a doubt, Nadine, lying to your doctor about how much you drink is a symptom and a sign that I'm saying that, you know, here and now, if you have ever lied to a doctor about how much you drink, that is a symptom of something that is not nothing. I'm not diagnosing what it is. I'm just okay. saying that is a thing. If you have ever lied to anyone about how much you drank, you know, or rather, or if you did drink, that is not zero, nothing, nada. That is rather a thing to come to your own self-awareness of and really sit with for yourself. Now, I say that knowing that people who are deep in alcohol use disorder, you know, I'm not really speaking to them today. That wasn't in my people I'm speaking to because I, I know you suffer and I, I, I put you in God's hands and those who love you and your doctor and, and most of all yourself. Um, but I just really do want to say, we do know what we uh, know, Nadine. This part of our conversation started because I asked you, um, you know, about the liver. I asked you in the old days when you drank, maybe we could say over drink based on a putting myself in dangerous converse, uh, situations and all the things, not being having any idea how I was going to get home and not caring. Um, and then I asked you, do you think your liver had fatty deposits on it? And you said something really extraordinary, which was, I know, I'm sorry, I know this is hard, but I really feel like this is uh, such a crux, which was, I know that alcohol was damaging my body. I didn't have to speak with a doctor to know that. And so um, I want to take this opportunity to um, hold up this children's coloring book. Some people are listening to us, not viewing us. So I'm saying that I'm holding up a children's coloring book called The Human Anatomy Coloring Book by Margaret uh, Matt. And it's a um, children's coloring book of the body systems. The, a children's coloring book I have, I actually bought 10 of them to give away to people of the body's systems. And it's presented in such a way that a child can understand, not a young child, but a school age child. And I'm bringing this up in this context now because of the liver, Nadine. I didn't know anything about the liver before and I know something about the liver now. And what I know, Nadine, is separate from the chemo drugs, which I don't know anything about, from the alcohol use that you're no longer engaged in, your liver is fully healed. Now, separate from the chemo piece, which I don't know anything about in this context today, I just want to say, um, I don't know if you've ever seen a picture of what they call a fatty liver from cirrhosis of alcohol use versus a um, healthy liver. But today your liver is completely healthy and you did that. Thank you for sharing that. I do have an old boyfriend of mine who used to drink a lot. He used to say all the time, oh, well, I can stop drinking. My liver will repair itself and that's okay. That was how he lived his life, unfortunately. Not not very long life, but um, you know, I've lost a lot of lovely people in my world through too much drink. But I take a lot of comfort from the fact that 
I'm looking after my liver now. Um, so that's a good thing. So disregarding what I've done in the past, it's more about what's happening now. And I can be proud of myself for that. Um, it's, it's, I'll tell you a funny little story now, this is really interesting. Um, I had, straight after my surgery, um, everything's all different shapes and everything. So um, because of the surgery and the swelling and that kind of thing, which is really annoying, it's still happening. Um, but my tummy underneath where I had my surgery was bulging out a bit, still is a little bit actually. And I straight away went, oh, oh my goodness, I've got a fatty liver because that's where the liver is. And I thought, oh my God. So I said to my medical team, you know, that my, my concern, and they laughed at me saying, oh no, it's the swelling um, because it's all the, everything's been moved around and everything's swollen up through to the surgery. Um, but I did straight away, I thought, well, that's really cruel, isn't it? I haven't had a drink for ages and now my liver is showing signs of something. Um, but it isn't. So I had, I was rest assured. But that fatty liver, you know, because you can, and I know people that you can see it. You can see an enlarged liver. You can see that. And that's what I was worried I had, but it isn't. I didn't know. I didn't actually know that. Are you saying that a protrud protruding in, like inflammation, you can see a fatty liver? Yes, because it enlarges and it gets harder and fatty. So you can actually see it on some people. Um, I have seen that. People, and doctors obviously know that. Um, but it does it does repair itself. So thank you for sharing that for other people to know that as well. We can help ourselves so much by stopping drinking. I um, mean, I have read quite extensively on this. And um, I, I know that when you stop drinking for 30 days, you're going to begin to see some repairing. And um, and that's why stopping for 30 days every now and then, living an alcohol-free life for 30 days is a thing. It's a big thing and it's not nothing. Now, this leads me uh, to something that we're going to discuss, which is hideous and horrible, but we're going to discuss it anyway. And that is what you brought up before, the emotional side of alcohol use. And our question, life without alcohol, how on earth do you live from an emotional perspective? We've talked about from a physical perspective um, and a sort of a, a mental perspective by uh, talking about things and understanding things, thinking through things in a more active way. And now we have to get to the emotional aspect. You revealed, shared and revealed that um, I felt the emotion come up, even though you didn't physically emote, but I felt energetic emotion when you said, um, you talked about making me question everything from the past, my behaviors from the past. And um, we know you've shared with us before uh, emotional drinking and how much easier it frankly is to simply drink to suppress. So how shall we get this part of our party started here? Do what we always do, just go for it. You're absolutely <laughs> right, so you your lead. Um, you're absolutely right. You know, I'm looking at everything now, questioning things, I'm looking at the reasons. This is a big part of it started when I started to cut down my alcohol. I had to feel my feelings more. Um, mm. there's a saying, I don't know who said it, but it was said to me, one of the best things about giving up alcohol is you feel your feelings. One of the worst things about giving up alcohol is you feel all your feelings. It's, oh. both, it's both of those things. And that, just as I said that to you out loud, I got chills because that's really profound, isn't it? Mm. But so true, you're going to feel it all. And then you might go back to it because it's so easy for me. I mean, I am now, you know, I have a lot of pain. I have a lot of fatigue. I have a lot of emotions that are coming up, you know, which is all good. But there are times I just think, oh, goodness, you know, it's too much. Having a drink can just get rid of all of that. So there is that temptation sometimes to think, well, that, you know, that's what I used to do. That's how I used to, you know, it's not, it's not what I want to do now, but there is a temptation, I've got to be honest, to just numb it all out because it does hurt. Um, so feelings are there. They're there to be questioned. I am supported by so many wonderful people. I have a lot of ways that I can help myself as well, as we all know with my calmer self method, to calm myself and reduce fear and anxiety. 
because drink was always for me a go-to whenever my feelings were there and I didn't like them I didn't even know what I was doing Susan I didn't know that that's what why I was choosing it but I can look back and go yeah of course I drank then because I couldn't cope you know I couldn't cope with something so I would have a drink I used to drink because I was tired I'd have a drink to liven myself up I'd have a drink because I was wired so I'd have a drink to calm myself down you know I went to alcohol for so many reasons so I am looking at that big time now and recently I, I shared with you didn't I we had our mother in Sunday here recently and um I I always have in the past I've had this kind of ritual since my mother died I haven't got children myself so I'm not a mother I haven't got a mother so I'd have a little pity party on Mother's Day all by myself not wanting to do anything with anyone you know don't no one could jolly me out of it um just being really sad, you know, playing music that made me sad, really going, I call it a wallow day, going with my feelings. And part of that used to be to have a drink as well. I'd have a drink with my mum. You know, I, I would say I drink with dead people. It, it helps me in a way connect with people in the past to have a little drink, a drink that I might have had with them. I do that with my mum. You know, this is a drink we used to have together so I can relive that memory. But this year no alcohol so that was an experience for me and I've got to be honest with you the feelings were painful the feelings that came up was I wasn't numbing them although it was a connection and everything and sometimes it makes your feelings you can be sad I can't you as well um but to actually go no I'm not having a drink this year and it's the honest truth it's the first time I've done it and just sit with those feelings and question them and work through them and feel them really really feel them um so yes it hurt but I'm glad I did it because it's very important and different feelings came up and maybe feelings that needed to come up that I had been pushing away so that again is part of my process to actually go yeah let's go with those feelings I, I am um I don't like to say the word braver but I I'm prepared to go through those feelings. I am in a place now where I'm not as scared of my feelings as I used to be so that I can go, okay, bring it on, whatever whatever I'm going to feel, however much I cry, however painful it is, I can do it. And, and so that's where, that wasn't like that before. I wasn't prepared to do that. I couldn't do that. So I can do it now and I'm glad of that. So so yes, it's it's feeling those feelings, being prepared to, and also to... I look back and I just think, goodness, you know, what was I so scared of? But I was scared and I don't need to actually qualify that necessarily. I was really scared of my feelings and that I'm learning now that was a big deciding factor on why I used to choose to drink feelings. So many emotions I couldn't cope with. So have a drink just numbs everything, doesn't it? Don't have those same emotions, you know. So that was definitely part of what I was doing it for. Well, let me um, say, um, pulling back the curtain as we do, Nadine, thank you so much. Um, I listened attentively, uh, feeling deeply. I was just now <clears throat> very um, energy buzzing through my body because um, only recently, before that Mother's Day, whatever day Mother's Day was where you are, we were um, uh, boxering back and forth, or maybe it, we, we were have, at the end of our last podcast conversation, we talked about it upcoming and you saying, I don't know what I'm going to do. And so um, that was honest. And you were like, I don't know what I'm going to do. I, I don't know if I'm going to drink or not. And I said, oh, okay, well, let me know how it goes. <clears throat> and today, uh, you're sharing this with us when you talked about um, uh, I sat with the feelings before it was too hard I numbed them without a doubt the use of alcohol is so good to suppress it's so good to avoid and deny it's like yes you know especially for people who drink more actively who have a higher use of alcohol um it's the easiest thing to do to, to pour 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 you know no problem at all but now you're sharing with us something i don't know if it's exactly profound 
but it's certainly extreme uh, to share uh, this experience with us. I just want to say thank you so much for just showing up like this and sharing this because what you just said about, you know, I drink with dead people, right? I wrote it down. I drink with dead people. I and then, but then you said, even as you said it, I felt it like, that was my connection with mom. I thought about, you know, what I would have done with mom. Now, my mom was a wine drinker. I don't think that my mother had a problem with alcohol, although it could be said if I talked to my sisters, maybe we might be like, did mom use alcohol to suppress, <laughs> you know, um, but not, it didn't, you know, seem to be problematic for her. But I drank wine with my mother, and this brings us to the next segment that I really want to get into, which is the habituation of um, of what it feels like to drink alcohol. But I'm I'm not ready to go there yet. But I, I just want to go there. I, I want to say that we're going to go there next. But I mean, wow, Nadine, this is so. Um, it's coming up for me that this is such an extreme part of your journey your cancer journey that apparently is intended for you to live an alcohol-free life for this time and experience what you're experiencing. So this, you know, what we're talking about is the question, we're still on this, well, why not? You know, like I'm challenging us because I'm in this too. I, to, I said earlier, I, I, I've said the same thing, oh, this isn't permanent. This is just something I'm doing. I'm experimenting with living an alcohol-free life. I'm wanting to see how it goes. But I'll be damned, Nadine, you know, when you listen back to this conversation, when I listen back to this conversation, which we always do, you know, you and I, we listen to our conversations. I mean, if you listen to it as somebody else, you might be saying like, what, what, there's some kind of unsync here. If with all of what you said about the use and then what you say about the non-use, why is it hard to say I'm never going back? Okay, I got the part where you said, you know, I might self-sabotage if I set that hard, fast line, you know, um, then I would want to fight it because I'm a rebel. First of all, I would challenge if you're still a rebel. I don't know that about you, if you're, if you are or not, but um, you said I might be setting myself up to fail. You know, the biggest thing that we're taught in the patriarchal society is success and failure. What does that mean? Um, one of the things uh, in the in the notes for this show, uh, we're going to have several resource articles and some resource links for people. And one of the ones I want to bring up now is the Reframe app. Uh, Reframe app has been around for just a few years now, and it's a tool to help you what become more consciously aware of your alcohol use in a way that doesn't feel punitive, but rather acknowledges how much am I really drinking because it's only you, your phone and the app that you know you have to be honest with, not your doctor or anyone else who would judge you. And then there's resource articles, there's daily meditations, there's all kinds of things to bring you back. Um, it connects alcohol use to money, something we have talked about before. Um, recently, I went out and my friend had a drink that her glass of wine was $21 on a, <clears throat> on a food bill. So there's money. And then we've talked about it. We're going to talk about this in another episode, sugar from alcohol and calories from alcohol. So it talks about that. So I wanted to say that's one resource we're sharing here today and, um, and there'll be more. So I'm going to um, park this. Um, so we're talking about covering emotions and I'm so stunned about what's coming up here uh, with your story about suppressing emotions and having to feel you said i'm braver then you um said um well i don't know if i'm braver or not but i do want to say it does take courage on this portion it does take courage to um to face the emotional trauma that every 100 percent of people have from their growing up years every every person has trauma that doesn't mean your parents were bad or they beat you or you know all of those terrible horrible things but just the evolution the you know the personal growth of a child to a, an adult 
is a traumatic experience of some sorts. And so um, I just want to um, say thank you, Nadine, for sharing your story. Uh, thank you for speaking to the emotion, uh, to how much easier it is to not have to feel. And I just wanted to say, was there anything else that you wanted to say at this time on this subject? Yeah, I, I think from that point of view of, of the feelings and really what I'm recognising now, as I say, I'm reflecting back and I'm really questioning everything. So I'm in a different place and a different reason. Um, that really I didn't... I didn't know that's why I was choosing to drink. It's not the only reason I chose to drink. You talked about habits and that kind of thing. I was, it was. There's, there's a little bit of sadness in me sometimes. It thinks, uh, you know, I'm not having that, the joy that came with a drink, with the social occasions and that. We're gonna, kind of get, we're gonna talk about that too. Yeah, will, yeah. There's a bit of that too. But looking back and actually recognizing that I was doing it, um, and and not just really not really. And there's got to be so many people that are, are maybe listening or watching this and actually going yeah but I have a drink but I'm not suppressing feelings I'm not doing that I haven't got a problem like you say you know ah uh, yes I never thought I had a problem I still don't think I had a drinking problem and I'm okay with that I'm just choosing something different it's not because I had a problem I don't think, you know but the people that maybe are drinking and saying no I'm not numbing feelings and everything they won't necessarily know that while they're in it because I didn't I didn't know that. If you'd have said that to me when I was drinking, I'd have denied it because I didn't recognize it. I didn't know it. Um, and I'm not, again, I'm not criticizing it. It's it's something to do. Sometimes it heightens your feelings. You know, it can make a celebratory occasion more of a celebration, can't it? Pop of a cork, that kind of thing. You know, there's, there's things that go with that. And I know we're going to talk about habits and rituals and that kind of thing. But for people that maybe don't recognize and, and are going, no, that's not me. I'm not numbing my feelings to go, that is okay because you might not realize that until later on, until you stop, until you question. If you ever do, and you don't have to, but that's what I'm doing now. I'm questioning everything and I look back and go, oh yeah, you know, I was like you say, the trauma of life, the trauma of growing up. To get through every stage of my life, it was, I'll have a drink, I'll have a drink, I'll have a drink. It was my go to, it's what I did. Well, as you said, there were people around you drinking, first of all. So you started very young, way too young, by any standards of any society. And, um, you know, so the, 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 the starting young, uh, doing what, and you said earlier, I even, I, read it, I even wrote it down, I compared myself to them and I said, well, I'm not as bad as they are. I, I wrote it down. Yeah. And um, and this business, uh, um, this is just so huge. I just need to sit with it for a second. You said, um, I didn't know why I was choosing to drink. If someone said to me, oh, you're just suppressing your emotions, I would have been like, no, I'm not. <laughs> That's not, you know, yeah. uh, and, and, and this conversation that we're having today, which is kind of ridiculous to tell you the truth, uh, that anybody, any one person might be listening to and inspired to activate the question of, you know, why am I drinking the way I do? Why did I lie to my husband? Why did I lie to my wife? Why did I lie to my doctor? Or, um, you know, why do I have a fifth of vodka, uh, you know, under my car seat? Or, you know, any one person who is activated to, uh, you know, like look at themselves and perhaps self-explore, self-reflect. You know, I, I held up this um, coloring book. When you're an interviewer, uh, sometimes you don't always get it right. And I, I just had this thought, like, did I even say why I held up this uh, coloring book? And in this context of asking myself these questions, I wanna say I ordered these coloring books so I could learn more about the anatomy connected to alcohol use disorder. That's why I ordered these coloring books because I didn't know anything about, honestly, I'm, I'm embarrassed as, you know, being as old as I am. I didn't know about the liver. I didn't know about the kidneys. Like, thank God, by the blessing and grace of God above and my good family genes, I didn't have to know these things. 
And so how, how can you know what you don't know? And so as a result of um, improving my own physical health, being aware of um, you know alcohol intake, sugar intake, salt intake, all the things, not that I don't do it, I, I did. I ate both salt and sugar last night, Nadine. But um, the I, I ordered this so I can be aware of the brain and the spinal cord so that I could be more aware of uh, the digestion and what liver does uh, to your organs. So Nadine, I mean, I just to sit in this moment here and now and say, for you to say, because those of us who are listening to our conversations know you and anybody who follows you, you know, you've been so uh, revealing and uh, sharing to help edify and heal the world. And to say, if somebody had asked me then, are you drinking to numb yourself? Are you drinking to not have to feel your emotions? Um, the words that I heard um, that I was told um, were a bit different. And that was, I always thought I could stop, but I never did. And so A, what you said, if someone asked me, are you drinking to numb your emotions and your feelings? I would have said no, which almost sounds ridiculous now in the new paradigm that we're talking about. Or B, I always thought I could stop. I always thought I could stop, but still I poured that drink and that drink and that next drink again. The, the, these are really the reasons that we're having this conversation to help encourage, inspire, motivate, or perhaps even instigate you, our listener or our viewer, to come a little bit, a little tiny bit higher in brave self-awareness to be asking these questions. So Nadine, I want to get uh, to the fun part, which is the um, social use of alcohol and also the habit. So this is where I want to reveal um, my reason, the truth um, that I'm not yet able or willing, not able, I can say the words, I'm never going to drink alcohol again. I just said those words, but the willingness to say, I'm never going to drink alcohol again, is that even at the level that I used in my day, there's never been one time that I consciously am aware that I ever lied to a doctor on those doctor forms. How many drinks a week do you drink? You know, like, I don't know, two, three, wine, you know, I was, you know, whatever. I don't know, however much it was, that's how much it was, and that's how much I said. So I don't ever uh, consider that I even came up to what would be called the low level of alcohol use disorder in my adulthood. And yet, honestly, the level of use I had created um, this uh, connection, this habituated connection. Uh, for me, it might've been holding a glass of wine it might have been the martini. You know me, I've talked about loving martinis. Um, <clears throat> and now I, I don't anymore. Um, and, and I'm not yet able or willing rather to say I never will again. So um, today I wanted to share with you, you can see this beautiful bottle of red wine. So this bottle is a um, brand which I'm not advocating for. I am not, not connected. Um, it's a brand called Clean. And it says Cabernet Sauvignon, which was one of my faves. And I was a red wine drinker. I also liked white wine Sauvignon Blanc. And it says alcohol removed wine. Okay, it's called, it's not non-alcoholic wine. It's called alcohol removed wine. But what is it? It's a bottle of wine to me and my sensibility. And, and for the people who are listening to this podcast, I'm holding up a beautiful bottle with a deep purple label that says Waterbrook Clean Cabernet Sauvignon. 
and it says alcohol removed wine. So I'm holding it up for our viewers to really show, make this point that I want to say. I haven't had a bottle of wine in my home uh, for 10 months or whatever it's been, um, nine months, eight months, whatever it's been. Not one. I haven't had a bottle of wine or a bottle of alcohol uh, in my home. And uh, to tell you the truth, Nadine, I, I miss it. And I, I miss ha having a glass of wine. I, I miss, now I'm saying this not from an overuse perspective, but the habituation. So um, now my, my young friend, my young 25 year old friend told me about friends, a couple of them the other night were talking about it and they told me about this thing called alcohol removed wine. I'm like, what's that? And now I know about it. So I did uh, get this bottle. You can see it's not open yet. I also got another brand. Um, I had it, it was literally horrible. Um, it's literally so bad. I, I wouldn't drink that other brand. At some point I'll open this, I'll taste this and see what it's like. And it doesn't meet that need at all. It doesn't meet that need at all. I can pour red juice into a wine glass and have something red. So I wanna to come to this aspect, Nadine the habituated use and what it feels like to have or to not have a drink. Um, I want to remind you that many, many, many months ago, we had a conversation in which you said you were thinking about going to a music festival. And at that time, um, you know, you were not going to drink because of your recent cancer diagnosis or something like this. And so I don't know if you ever did go to that music festival, but we talked a lot about how it would feel to go and not drink. So what would you like to share about all of this, Nadine? Can I just say one thing? The topic of alcohol-free drink, another conversation is a good one. I have a oh, lot okay. of opinions. So let's put that one there for a start. But thank you for sharing that, it's interesting. But in answer to your question, I didn't go to the festival. My immunity was still, you know. Ah, uh, yes. Out. Um, but it did make me think, you know, how would I deal with that situation, not having a drink, because that's my habit. Um, and I and I do, as I said earlier, there's a lot of sadness now. I think, well, I won't enjoy it if I don't have a drink. I'm not doing what everyone else is doing. And I'm not part of the group, you know, that kind of thing. These are the, the habits, traps maybe, if you like. You know, we, we do. It was definitely one of the reasons I started drinking, to be like everyone else to do something I thought was grown up, to be, like say, holding a glass. I used to think it was so glamorous, it was so lovely. I still do, to be honest, that's part of my sadness. I, yeah. can, see, I can see things on the television and everyone's, oh, let's have a drink and a lovely glass and a lovely drink and maybe a nice fireside or something. And I go, oh, no, I want that. There is that still in me and maybe always will be, and that's fine. Um, and I do think, that's a sadness that I'm not doing that. But then I look at the reasons why and that's okay. So I'm adjusting, I'm still getting used to that because it was a habit, definitely. And the whole idea of, you know, it's part of a celebration, it's part of what we do. And I don't know about you, Susan, and you said about, you said to your friends recently, I'm just not having a drink and that's okay. It's never been okay in my world. When I was younger, I say I'm not having a drink. Well, I wouldn't have a lie, I'd have said it. <laughs> but it was, you're having a drink. You know, you're having, that's what you do. Um, when I first started driving, and I, I was so pleased at being able to drive, I thought it was so clever, that I wanted to drive everywhere, and I didn't drink. I didn't drink and drive. Um, people did years ago, but I didn't. And again, I'm not putting anyone down for it, people make their own choices, but... I didn't, so I wanted to drive everywhere. And my social circle at the time didn't like me sober for a start, but also kept going, oh, no, leave the car, have a drink, have a drink. There was pressure, peer pressure, social pressure on me to drink alcohol. And I see that still now. So there is that habitual and people do it. I don't know about you, Susan, but in my world, um, there was a lot in my social circle there was a lot of drug taking all kinds of things alcohol I know is a drug I choose it as a drug I say it's a drug it was my drug of choice if you like if I turned down a line of coke no one would be like oh that's okay move on but actually if I said no I don't want a drink there would be pressure it was not easy to say no to a drink 
with the people that I was surrounded with in my youth. Um, and as I say, I still think that happens a little bit now. I don't know if you, do you find that as well in, in your world? Is, is it that people- That's so interesting. I never, uh, cocaine, uh, I've never done cocaine in my life. I've never even, to tell I'm not even sure I've ever seen cocaine in real life. Like I never went to a place where there were lines except in the movies. You know, I, I the, 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 you know, marijuana, of course, I didn't happen to uh, use marijuana. It just didn't, I, I was too afraid of it. I don't know. So, but of course I was, places where it was being used. So the drugs um, were not per se a part of my personal world, but to the point of this question, this is oh, this is a, a very uh, big one. I do have a young person in my life uh, who has made a decision to be sober from weed. That's the way they say it. I'm sober from weed use. And this is a very young person to already be sober. But I notice there's still alcohol use, not overuse. I'm not implying, I'm not saying nothing, nothing. There's nothing there. I'm, I'm just saying per this conversation um, that you're asking uh, very uh, distinctly, I can, I can tell my friends, you know, I'm sober. I don't, I don't need a, whatever you do with weed these days, I don't do that. And there's no peer pressure at all, zero for this uh, young person. But uh, I, I don't know. I'm going to ask this person, what if yeah. you were sober from alcohol? What would that yeah. be like to this very point? So, um, yeah, my social circle didn't like me not drinking. Yeah, and that, and that did make me feel, I mean, I got to a point of actually going, right, okay, I won't drive. I was, as I say, so excited about being able to drive. And then I started to go, no, I won't. I'll, because of the social circle I was with the people it made them uncomfortable and I and I was the people pleaser so I didn't want to do that so I just conformed but like you talk about you know if you like drugs over alcohol for me personally again um and I know alcohol is a drug as I say it was my drug of choice if you like I was scared you said about fear I was scared of all the other things they they weren't um I didn't know how I would be on that I was quite comfortable with how i was on alcohol um although it wasn't a good way to be necessarily but I was okay with it I was scared of taking anything else so again I would quite easily go no I don't have any of that but I will have a drink and it almost like it was my I'm still doing something I'm still joining in with everyone I'm not being the boring old person who doesn't do anything which is how I used to see it I used to think the people that didn't have a drink that didn't let their hair down and everything they were boring that was how I saw it so now again I'm having to question am I boring now am I something you know am I boring people I don't want to do that and I know when I did cut down my alcohol use as I say about 20 years ago that was a big thing and I remember saying to my boyfriend you're oh, now going to be boring aren't I and he said no you're not luckily he said no you're not <laughs> but I thought I would be so again, I'm really looking at why I chose alcohol. We are, you know, the very essence here of confidence and calm. I chose alcohol because I lacked confidence. I would say sometimes, I can't go to that party without a drink. But not, not necessarily before. I wasn't one of those people that would have a drink I was, I was getting ready. But I knew when I was there, I wanted a drink to give me confidence. So how many other people are doing that? You know, it, it's quite understandable, isn't it, sometimes? Because... Or I'll have a quick drink and I've got a bit of confidence. So um, you ask, so how many other people are doing that? And the answer is countless. This is something I know now that I didn't know then. Even though I suffered from anxiety, Nadine, I did suffer from anxiety without a d doubt. I was di clinically diagnosed. I was on medication for seven years uh, as having uh, anxiety slash depression the sort of anxiety led to kind of depression. Um, but still in all, uh, in that case, I, I'm gonna have to think about this and we'll come back to it another time perhaps. I I never, uh, I don't, I can't remember a time that I ever took a drink to suppress anxiety or, or something like that. That didn't happen to be my thing. I, I don't know what was my thing, but um, so, but now I know something I didn't know then about how much people do use alcohol to suppress what I call anxiety persona. 
That's capital A, anxiety persona. And, um, and those are the people who might, uh, earlier in the conversation, when um, I, I sort of challenged a little bit, you know, write blatantly out to people, are you lying to your doctor? Are you lying to your loved ones about how much you drink? Are you lying to yourself? You know, did you take a drink in order to be more confident to go to that party? I'm not saying it's a crime. Is it a crime? No, it's not a crime unless you got in the car and drove, right, from over after over drinking. But um, yeah, we're just kind of saying things right out loud. You know, Nadine, I'm aware of the time passing, but I feel this conversation is so important to take the time to speak directly, freely, honestly, confidently, calmly about these issues kind of out loud with the hope and intention that people might see themselves, uh, hear themselves, maybe look at themselves in a way. And you said, I chose alcohol because I lacked confidence, you know, at that time, episodically uh, in your life or for a long time. You also said, I thought I was boring if I didn't drink. Yeah. So that is addiction talking yes, yes. addiction tells you you're boring if you don't drink that's that's addiction speaking it's not real i've never drunk with you i've never once had a drink with you <laughs> i've never you know we've never even met in person we've never been together in person there's never been a time that we said oh let's have a glass of wine now, i'm drinking coffee because it's 6 30 a.m my time 2 30 p.m your time you have your herbal tea with you um and here we are we just acknowledged years later that we've been getting together and boring is not one of the things that I think anybody would say about either of us. Uh, when I say to myself, oh, I have to have a drink, you know, to go to the party, to, you know, to help me feel better, or I'm boring if I don't have a drink, or uh, you, earlier you said, um, you know, it lifts me up if I'm tired, or it brings me down if I'm wired. Yeah, right. And so that's also a myth because alcohol is a depressant without a doubt. It doesn't lift you up, even though you, you get an up from the immediacy of the high from being drunk. Um, but, you know, alcohol is without a doubt. We know exactly what it does. It's not what addiction tells you that it does. So, oh, my gosh, um, this part is important. You said watching people have a drink by the fire. It's beautiful. Um, recently, I went out with some new friends, a lovely couple I met, and we were at some restaurant and I ordered, um, actually, I got there a minute early. They weren't there yet. And I ordered um, mango juice with seltzer. Like I saw on the menu that they happen to have a um, mango juice. So I said, hey, could you put some club soda or seltzer in it, whatever you have? And he's like, yes, of course. Now, I didn't think, can you add a bit of lime, which might have made it fancy or dress it up a bit and also would be yummy. I'll do that next time I go to that place. But um, so then when they got there, I had this glass of juice, mango juice, and they ordered wine. Um, this this comes up a lot um, when you are living life without alcohol. Uh, for me, I'll speak only for myself, I notice other people's alcohol use and how they don't think that it's overuse. And I'm sitting there saying, I'm watching overuse, you know, but um, maybe we will do a, a small bit episode on um, alcohol-free drinks. Um, yeah, maybe what you've just said could come into that, couldn't it? Because it is, you know, it's it's important to look at that and see how people, again, to question, am I drinking because I want to fit in? Am I drinking because, you know, there are other ways of actually doing that. I think nowadays, I don't know what's in people's glasses. I don't care what's in people's glasses, whether it's alcohol or not. And I choose to think nobody knows or cares what's in mine. But it used to be quite important to me. You know, I used to be I, I used to judge myself and I think maybe other people by how much they drank, how well they could hold their drink. And that's not really the right thing to say. But I used to show off, oh, I can have loads of drink and I'm fine, you know. But that's not, I used to be quite 
I can say proud of that. But now I just think, oh my goodness, what was I doing? But different world, different life, you know. Of so, course you were proud of it, drinking someone under the table. That's an I expression, <laughs> of course. That's it. And, and you know what? Someone used to say that, oh, she'd drink you under the table. And then it was a competition and I had to drink, you know. that I got in that reputation, that kind of, you know, that was the way it was and I, and I would live up to it because again, my people pleasing was there, but also my showing off, you know. Um, but it, where you and I've said it about suppressing emotions. Again, I I do recognise now that sometimes alcohol allowed me to show emotions, and again that comes from a self conscious sort of uncomfortable place. I go, well, I have a drink. I can be a bit more lovey dovey. I can be a bit more. I can maybe say something I'm not comfortable saying, and I want to. So again, that was a a use that I could see at the time was quite beneficial. So again, now I'm thinking, okay, I I need to do that in a in a way without alcohol. So if I want to say something I'm a bit unsure of or I'm self conscious, can I do it without alcohol? You know, to to challenge myself. But and, and how and actually, has that come up for you? Has there been to a a, a close person or so, any whatever the circumstance might be that alcohol in the past maybe allowed me to to show emotion or to say yes. something I might not be able to say. Have you yes. been faced with this uh, since? Yes, I have. And again, with my cancer diagnosis, it's very much about, you know, feeling all the feelings and really expressing that love and that, and, and you know, and I've shared it on these chats quite a lot. When people express love and, and care for me, my emotions are all over the place. That's when I lose it. Um, because I'm not that comfortable with dealing with my emotions. I'm learning. Um, and again, without the use of alcohol, when I was out the other evening, as I say, going to this wonderful social occasion, that was such a big deal for me. Um, a friend, one of the birthday girls was so pleased to see me. She got up on the microphone, called me up to her and made a big speech about, oh, isn't it wonderful to see Nadine? She hasn't been out for a year. She's going home now because she's tired, she said, because I was just about to go. And I just burst into tears. <laughs> Oh, it was so lovely. It was so lovely for someone to be so kind and caring. Look, I'm getting emotional now saying it. But I just, that's what, so that's the kind of situation where I go, oh, I have a drink to, to get that because I am showing the love and the care. I'm not so comfortable with. So again, I'm having to learn how to do that in a better way. And I can do it. Um, And I want to do it. That's the other thing, you know, because also, I want to remember those feelings. I have been very, very lovely, dovey and very wonderful and all sorts of things going on. And I don't remember them. So that's, you know, there oh, is, there is that. So oh, good. Yeah, so so it's, it's really for lots of reasons. But as I say, my emotions, that might not tear away because the emotions are there. Um, getting okay with those emotions and actually going, yes, I'm going to say what I want to say because, you know, you know, I use my being English as an excuse, but I'm not, I don't say I love you all the time. I don't do all that. But the cancer diagnosis has made me really want to embrace that, you know, really feel the love and show the love, partly because I thought I might die, you know, so we want to do that, don't we? That's a real thing. Um, but also because I want to, you know, I want to be that person that shows their feelings and not hide them, but not to go, oh, well, I'll be all lovey-dovey when I've had a few drinks because that was easier. I mean... So, yeah. The energy coming up for me right now is so extreme uh, for you to say this. Go ahead, blow your nose, wipe your eyes. <laughs> for the people who are listening, uh, Nadine's having an emotional moment, which, you know, usually it's me crying here. And, um, and, and uh, in my world, in Susan's world, I learned uh, over the last entire decade, when tears like that come up, I call it the soul showing herself whereby uh, the soul is relieved now she has voice she can speak she can say i love you to someone she can hear and receive i love you nadine you're so uh, important and precious and special in my life but when just now you said um i want to say it i want to do it this way now why? Because I was even thinking to myself, you know, you said when people express love for me, it was uncomfortable. Me, so, so I'm uh, uncomfortable, so I might suppress it. Uh, if I <clears throat> if I wanted to show emotion, I had to take alcohol uh, to yes. do it. And then I was like, 
well, why wouldn't you do that? That's okay. And then you said, why? Because I want to remember and the energy of someone in alcohol use disorder, even at a low level, remember it's called alcohol use disorder now, not alcoholism, and it's diagnosed at low, medium, high levels. You can look this up. We're going to have a couple of resources in the notes. Um, and you said, I want to do it without the suppress suppression of alcohol so I remember in alcohol use disorder there's lying as I called out so blatantly but there's also forgetting and if you are sitting here listening or viewing uh, this discussion today and you know honestly to yourself because it really doesn't matter it's between you and God <laughs> if you believe in God or you yourself in you and you know that you do not remember things because of use of alcohol you know you might remember Nadine you said you know, I was able to be lovey-dovey after I had some alcohol, but you didn't have the what? The experience of it because you forgot, you know, you knew something happened maybe or whatever, but you forgot. And I'm calling this out if, you know, to our viewers and our listeners, if you have ever um, or many times, if you're honest with yourself, uh, drink, uh, drunk to the point of forgetting, not remembering something, not knowing something, not, you know, knowing that you weren't yourself in an up way or a down way, and not being able to, um, you know, sort of face that. This is part of why we're having this conversation today. Nadine, it's, it's so, again, it comes up for me, it's so extreme extreme it's extreme for you to say i want to remember what i said or what i heard and, and what i felt as i say that lovely moment when my friend made a speech on my behalf i got around to applause and everything which i just absolutely adore um but it's that kind of you know i wouldn't have remembered that if i had been drunk i, I would have been in the moment i would have been there but i wouldn't i can feel those feelings so just telling that story to you again now the emotions have come up again and I'm feeling it again, and that's what I want. I don't want to not feel those feelings. So again, that comes from me being a different person and being braver, like we said earlier, to actually challenge that. But I want that. You know, what a shame to miss it. You know, I how many wonderful, wonderful moments have I missed? How many wonderful moments have I forgotten? You know, that's that's sad. So I don't want to do that. I want to really feel it, and I'm brave enough now to go. Yeah, okay. So I cry. Okay, I. I can't handle it that well, but I still want it. So that's how I've changed. And this is something I do, you know, the, the topic of this is al alcohol-free life, question mark, you know, to say to everybody, you know, to not be scared of that, which is the reason that I chose to drink, one of the reasons I chose to drink, to be scared of my feelings, good, bad, everything, to not be scared and actually embrace them and just go with it, because otherwise we're missing so much, aren't we? And again, you know, thank you to my cancer diagnosis. I have to be grateful for that because it's made me go, right, sort this out now because now is my time, you know, to actually use this for the good and go, yeah, I'm going to deal with this. I'm going to feel my feelings. And, and you know, every time someone is lovely to me, the emotions come. And I always feel that it's like, like you said, it's your soul expressing, you know, it's relief, isn't it? It, tears are a sign of relief you know I'm definitely my body is going oh she can do this now it's okay we can cry you know it's okay um but also it is that just feeling I I always feel when someone fills my heart with love and joy as as happened when my friend made this wonderful speech for me um the tears come out because I'm full up I'm so full up it's over overflowing of the love and the out, outpouring that is coming out and that's how I feel it comes up in me that actually my heart is full to the point of like overflowing. So tears come out. And, and I think that's lovely. They, they're, as I always say, it's happy tears. It's not, you know, they're not sad tears. They're lovely, lovely tears. So, you know, so um, as, people to do. as I've learned with my experience, again, it wasn't me. Um, when you drink uh, too much, uh, vomiting is a part of your life. Uh, if you have a secret life of hidden drinking, 
vomiting is a part of it. And I'm wondering perhaps if your liver uh, gets more affected, you vomit more. I'm not sure about that. I have to look into that. But um, when you just said, um, my heart is full to the point of um, overfilling, you said, um, this weird, uh, dark, stark, energetic contrast showed itself to me from the being overfilled of alcohol to the point of vomiting outside of a bar, uh, up in the middle of the night in your own bathroom, uh, having to stop the car to open the door, uh, all kinds of things. Uh, you know, it's funny when you're 19 in college and somebody's vomiting out a window, that's hysterical. Um, but as uh, in your, and that hysterical was in quotation marks, it's not hysterical uh, that, you know, I'm remembering it's not hysterical. I was just saying it, we think it is that because that's what you're supposed to do. Um, but when you live your adult life and you're overfilled with alcohol and vomiting up uh, to the point that you know exactly why you're vomiting and you know what's happening, but you can't, I don't know what to say about that. I have to make a comma after that. Um, versus, versus this uh, thing that Nadine just shared, my heart is so full to the point of overfilling the soul comes up in tears in the emotional experience of feeling loved yes. feeling loved and now yes. we're not gonna go further longer and forever talking about shame i have a podcast called um living beyond the core wounds with cornelia stephanie and shame is one of the the deepest darkest densest, dankest core wounds. Uh, there's so much shame connected to alcohol use. Uh, we're not going to get into that uh, today, Nadine. But to say my heart was so filled to the point of over, you know, full to the point of overfilling, that contrast showed it to me itself to me. But I came back to the light to say, my yes. God, how beautiful and amazing i could feel the energy of your friend grabbing you up taking the microphone and saying how amazing you know and beautiful nadine is here with us it's the first time she's been out in a year and just showering you with that love whereby you were sober you were alcohol free able to receive uh in a in a uh, over in a authentic way, the experience of somebody loving you and every being, everybody else being like, Nadine, yeah. we love you, right? No. So beautiful. Yeah, and and that is so. I don't even know what to say. That is just so good, Nadine. <laughs> what is your friend's name? My friend who did that for me is lovely Lynn. She is my. She's been my friend for so so long, and she, it was her birthday. She was seventy. She is. God bless so, her. That's amazing. Yeah, God bless her. God bless her. And she was just and and actually, you know, someone sent me a message the day after saying, "Were you feeling all the love that you were out last night?" And I just said, "Yes, I was." You know, there was a well, lot of love. Somebody innocently sent you a message, yeah. innocently, unknowingly, and said, "Were you feeling all the love?" To which you could yeah. honestly, genuinely, authentically respond, "Yes, I was feeling it." So, so, so blessed. I am wonderful people in my life. As I yeah. Know. Just to, uh, as an, a little tiny bit of an aside, I thought to myself, because you shared the 10 years later photograph of your friend Lynn and you, yeah. and, and you just revealed i hope it's okay with her she j just turned 70. i thought to myself oh that must have been her 50th birthday 10 years ago and this must have been her 60th because <laughs> she looks so good uh so you can tell uh lynn yeah, i said uh, that you know what i will i will do and i will put a picture out of her, of her party when she was 70 because she is amazing 
Um, but it was two other ladies as well, two 60th birthdays and 70th. And, yeah. it's just, so and, and, and these are my wonderful, wonderful friends and they are inspirational and they're amazing. So I'm so glad that we So good. I don't even honestly know what to do with this conversation today. I feel like so emotional at, at this honest, you know, blatant conversation that we're having about living an alcohol-free life. And, you know, to just bring it back and say um, for each of us in the experience, you know, like, why wouldn't we say this is my life going forward? I am choosing to live this way. You know, why why wouldn't we say, you know, I'm making this decision and yet even still I I understand, you know, why we're not it's if if anybody listens to this entire conversation and you know, even still uh, understands at this point how either you in all of your experience that you've shared or me, you know, with what I've shared here today understands, um, you know, why we still even yet can't or won't say you know, I'm living my life alcohol free. It's the easiest decision I ever made. You know, that's the draw. And that's, you know, that's the pull. And I just want to say to anybody listening, you know, we get you. And we're not here to judge you. And, um, and we love you. And, uh, you know, that's just, it Nadine, I, I can't think of any better way to end this, you know, blatant raw conversation. No, it's so more, isn't it? It's so, and I thank you, Susan, for bringing this up and 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 helping me to share it because you know you make it easy for me to talk this way. So thank you so much. And just to say to anybody listening or watching, if you want to blub and cry and feel all the feelings like me and Susan are doing right now, then. Go for it, go for it, be brave, step into it, you know, because it is actually, you know, whatever anyone is thinking, we are crying tears of absolute love and joy at the moment. And that's wonderful, isn't it? I'm so grateful that we can do this. It's so amazing. And I just want to say again, um, I've said this most episodes, I'm going to say it again. Nadine is the calmer self coach. And um, part of the reason perhaps uh, her method evolved for herself, which is now what she uses with others, uh, is uh, the, this feeling of being more calm, more in charge of yourself, of your life. And I encourage you to, um, you know, click on the link in the notes where you'll find uh, the information that Nadine offers on her calmer self method. My method is the confidence zone. Uh, it's a four part method that starts with consciousness, coming to consciousness, coming to conscious awareness. That's the first phase of my method. Nadine even said it, even though it wasn't planted. She said, I chose alcohol because I lacked confidence. And um, and so we are here uh, in real time sharing our experiences with you, which authenticate our work as coaches, <laughs> even though that wasn't planned either. Nadine, my friend, as always, um, we have identified a few more topics for us to get into another time, but I want to say thank you so much for showing up here, uh, showing up real, and for saving lives today. Thank you, Susan. And I've got to add, you know, part of the reason I'm building my confidence is thanks to you. You know, you really walk your talk, you are the confidence coach and you really, you just do it naturally, don't you? You help people with their confidence. So thank you so much. Until next time, my friend, <laughs> we'll go get a few tissues. I'll see you soon. Thank you.